Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Automation and Optimization Technologies for Bioprocessing Operations. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Fujifilm Irvine Scientific. To learn more, please visit IrvineSci.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Tom Fletcher, Director of Process Development R&D at Fujifilm Irvine, Irvine Scientific, and Guy Matthews, Director of Market Development Single Use Technology at Fujifilm Irvine Scientific. Tom, Guy, you may now begin your presentation. All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and it's absolutely my pleasure today to talk to you on this topic. So when you hear the name Fujifilm, many of you already recognize the name as a company heavily invested in life sciences. And in particular, you know, cell biology is kind of at the center of life sciences for Fujifilm. So this has been an absolute, uh, you know, strong benefit to our business at Fujifilm Irvine Scientific, as we support so many interesting activities with cell culture media. So we're very involved in many uh, areas here, and it's been a, a real boost to our position in the life science market. So as a company, uh, Fujifilm Irvine Scientific has been uh, in, involved in cell culture media for over 50 years. So we're actually one of the very first uh, companies focused on developing and supplying cell culture media. And so again, something that some of you know, but maybe not all of you, is we represent a company that was first in developing serum-free media for CHO, serum-free media for hybridoma cells, and serum-free media for HEK293 cells. So that was quite a few years ago. And of course, we've been very busy finding ways to improve media continuously and keeping up with uh, the needs of the industry. So we've been, been in the business a long time, uh, been around the block a few times, and so we're happy to give an update now on uh, the business and, and where we're moving. So we're also happy now that we can cover the globe with uh, manufacturing and supply. And so, you know, we have manufacturing facilities on three continents here in the U.S., in Japan, and then in the Netherlands. And actually, these slides were made several weeks ago, so I'm, I'm happy to be the one to tell you that we have a new facility being built in North Carolina, which will be become our largest uh, in terms of capacity. And that allows us to supply both coasts of the U.S. Um, on short notice. And so, again, um, you know, manufacturing and supply is a big part of our business, and we're able to support global uh, supply. Now, when we develop products, you know, one thing that distinguishes us from, I think, other suppliers is, you know, we really take effort to design our, our products with, um, you know, beginning with the end in mind. So these are purpose-built products designed in several ways to make them uh, relevant to, to the customer. And so beginning with the idea of using relevant model cell lines, I, I consider this to be the very most important thing when you develop media. And so we've, we've made efforts to use relevant model cell lines, high producing cell lines, so that they're consuming high amounts of nutrients. We've also um, been careful to measure the right things. You know, we're looking at growth, productivity, product quality attributes. And then when we're developing fed batch media, we, we are you know, conscious of the need for complementary designs of the growth medium and the feed medium so that they are compatible. And actually, there's a synergy between the growth media and the feed media. And then scalability is an issue that is very important. So something else we think about, and uh, today we'll be talking about this, um, you know, these last bullet points where we talk about design for easy preparation and use. And so what we've learned is there can be a lot of issues, time consuming issues, variation, if the uh, design of the powder media is not easily hydrated. And so we, we design our powders and liquids to be easy to prepare and use. Um, and so we'll talk more about how we can avoid adjustments such as pH, osmolality, QSing the water volume, 
and our powders are always designed to be soluble, filterable, and stable. So how can we take these advantages that have been built into our products and offer them to uh, people who own their own formulas? So many of you in the audience, maybe you own a media formula, you're just looking for somebody to manufacture it for you. And so we'd like to uh, offer you know, our services, not only to manufacture, but actually to help you understand how to use that, that powder media. So this is not something, you know, this was really not just our idea, but it's been clearly communicated in many ways, including the survey that was done several years ago, where a survey of 24 large biopharma companies, you know, clearly revealed that there were needs in terms of media prep. And so, you know, kind of to summarize these needs, I think people are not happy with how much time and effort is spent and then the risks of variation that can occur. And so this is something that's very important because a pharmaceutical company doesn't really want to be worrying about these, you know, more mundane tasks, these things that are just basically dealing with raw material preparation. And so I think it really begs this question, you know, how can these methods be improved? How can we do better as a supplier in terms of serving our customers? Other comments that came directly from this survey really focused around the risk of variation, the time that's involved, the amount of effort, um, you know, various difficulties, various things that are awkward and concerning to the people who need to use the media. So again, when we saw this evidence and we heard it directly from customers, we realized there's an unmet need here. And as a supply partner to these biopharmaceutical companies, we really wanna be part of the solution. We're very much customer centered. And so if our customers need something, we're, we wanna be the solution to that problem. And so when I talk about media prep challenges, I mean, here's some more descriptions of what we're talking about. So when, you, when it comes to hydrating powder media, you know, these issues can very much be formula dependent. So, you know, we're talking about complex nutrient mixtures. And so from formula to formula, there might be unique issues, but typically they have to do with things like solubility of the nutrients, potential interactions that can occur between the nutrients. And I give some examples here like uh, complexation or speciation of metals, reduction, oxidation reactions. These things happen on a fairly regular basis if you know, proper procedures are not followed. Um, and some of these things can occur slowly, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to detect. But some oxidation reactions in particular can be you know, very slow, happening over days or weeks. So being aware of that chemistry and how to, how to minimize this risk or how to prevent it, I think is very valuable to the end user. And then again, because of the complexity of these formulas and the chemistry, some of these things are difficult to predict. They're not well characterized. And so having been in this business for over 50 years, again, we've seen, you know, many examples of the, th the things I've listed here, and um, we're happy to share, you know, what we've learned from, from those examples. So in the last category, besides the, the chemistry, I think this idea of human intervention, you know, it's not that we have anything against humans, but I think that this is commonly the uh, conclusion of investigations is, somewhere along the line there was a human uh, judgment a human intervention that resulted in some variation and so there are many ways that we can address that as well in terms of you know pre-weighing um you know the components or the, the powders make packaging them in ready to use uh, you know packages avoiding adjustments you know again i mentioned it earlier that adjusting ph adjusting osmolality or even adjusting the amount of water in the formula these are things that don't need um, you know human intervention these these are things in chemically defined media that should be very very consistent and we can typically engineer these things into the dry powder so nobody has to you know be watching a ph meter and titrating with uh, base and same thing with liquid supplementation. We can often integrate these things into a single simple formula or perhaps divide the formula into parts. So these are things we've learned over, over the years um, and uh, dealing with some of these challenges. Now, this particular, these solutions I'm talking about are actually more obvious in late stages of development. The reason I mention that is we've already had services um, for early stage uh, you know, pharmaceutical development in terms of collaborative uh, media development, 
collaborative um, express media service where we're simply supplying materials for media development and process development. So those are those are services that have been offered for a number of years. They've been very successful in you know building relationships as a supply partner with our customers. And that's when speed is really the most important thing. What we've learned is that you know later in later stages of uh, drug development, the needs change from speed to things about you know reliability and overall cost of this process. That's where people begin to realize, wow, this labor and this human intervention, and these types of things that I've built into my procedures, it can be expensive. It can be a source of variation. And so for that reason, we've um, targeted a service now that we call the MSAT service towards um, improving reliability, reducing cost in later stages of drug development. It could be really at any stage, even after um, commercial you know, manufacturing begins, but it's, uh, it's typically something that addresses the needs in later stages of, of drug development. And so we see our role, as you can tell, as a supply partner. We're not just a place where you come to purchase media out of a catalog or something like that, but this is very much about, you know, helping our customers become successful. And so I talked about efficiency. Yeah, so our real goal in this service, and one of our goals is to improve efficiency. So we can actually look at a current process for media preparation or buffer preparation, and we can typically identify multiple opportunities to improve that process, either by reducing the amount of time uh, or eliminating human intervention, or perhaps even introducing some automation. And so that's a preview. We'll be talking about that later. My colleague, Guy Matthews, will be talking about automation solutions. And so these are all ways, again, to improve the efficiency of a process. We can reduce time, we can reduce cost for both labor and for goods. Now, when I, again, I'm gonna get a little bit specific here when it comes to improving media preparation methods. So this is just kind of a list of things as examples. It's not comprehensive, but we can deliver pre-measured amounts of dry ingredients or perhaps liquid supplements, ready to use packaging, that's fairly obvious. We can simplify and improve the repeatability of the medium prep through formula engineering. So we can actually move things around or compartmentalize components that are not compatible and that will actually improve the repeatability. So make it, you know, simple like, you know, baking a cake instead of requiring a lot of adjustments and things like that. We can design actually the powder formula so it achieves targeted values for pH, osmolality, and again, the amount of water. I find it surprising how frequent it is that people are doing QSing at large scale. So you've got thousands of liters of media prep or buffer prep, and the procedures require a technician to you know, QS the volume with water to a target. Well, again, I think that's asking for a variation when in reality, you can simply add the same amount of water every single batch that you make. And so we, we can engineer that into the instructions or into the powder formula itself. We can integrate supplementary nutrients. And this avoids, you know, that task of adding separate supplements. And um, again, it takes time. It's asking for variation when you have to measure and add things separately. And just kind of the opposite, we could actually combine or we, we can separate incompatible components. And there are many cases where, say, a redox pair might cause a reaction with each other. Simply keeping them separate from each other oftentimes can be, you know, an attractive solution. We can also use sodium salts of amino acids or other organic acids, and that will help us achieve the proper pH uh, target. Um, so that's a fairly obvious one to me, using something like a sodium salt of, of an amino acid. We can use dipeptides or phosphorylated forms to improve solubility. And with iron in particular, we can use stable complexes in order to avoid the oxidation of iron, which again is a common problem. I think people don't realize uh, every, every time, but um, sometimes this is one of the issues with variation in, in cell culture media. And then we can optimize the order of addition. So sometimes it matters, you know, you add this before that, and then you wait till this dissolves before you add the next thing. So just trying to illustrate some examples here of, you know, things that we've dealt with in the past where we can apply, you know, lessons learned to help our customers. Now here's one case study that was quite um, 
you know, quite remarkable in terms of, you know, our, our customer really didn't know what to do. They had these three different bulk mixtures and they were uh, dissolving them one at a time. They were having solubility issues. And so as soon as we got to learn more about what they were doing, we could identify quickly, you know, some of the components in these bulk powders were um, not the most soluble forms. We could recommend alternative forms. We could engineer the pH. And by the end, we could basically combine these into a single bulk powder. And so overall, in this example, we were able to simplify the process. We were able to um, improve the efficiency tremendously. And more importantly, the reliability of this process is so much better now because it doesn't require all of that human intervention, all of those adjustments, all of that mixing time. So it was a great example for us to learn from in terms of how much we can help just based on you know the knowledge and the experience that's come from these many years of being in cell culture media. Um, so we manufacture cell culture liquid every single day uh, starting from bulk powder. So we have, um, you know, that wealth of experience to draw on. Now, most of these ideas are, you know, based on just simple chemistry. And, uh, you know, on this slide, I pick on tyrosine in particular because it ends up being, you know, one of the most common issues that we that we see. And once you understand the chemistry of tyrosine, it becomes obvious, oh, well, that's why we're having all these issues. You know, it's got this phenolic side ring. It's got this... Um, you know, a triprotic structure. So basically it can exist in four different species depending on the pH. So it's very much a pH dependent nutrient. It's very important for most cell culture processes. So understanding again, how to manage this particular nutrient, I think is a key to finding ways to um, provide more user-friendly formats for dry cell culture media. And then one other thing that's actually quite interesting, and we learned some of these things by being involved in AMBIC. So AMBIC is a great, um, you know, organization for us to be involved in. And here's just an example from AMBIC where we've seen um, how amino acids are Im impacted by ionic strength. And so, you know, cysteine is an example where, you know, increasing amounts of sodium chloride can be beneficial in terms of solubility. So that's like a salting in effect but tyrosine and leucine are really just the opposite. So again, understanding some of this fundamental chemistry, some of the matrix effects between these components is important to being able to prescribe solutions. And so we're learning by, by staying involved, we're, we're gathering our own data, but also involved in, in consortiums like AMBIC. And I think it's a real benefit to the industry at large to, to consider these things. Now I'm showing only sodium chloride in one amino acid at a time. The fact is we've got, you know, something like 60 or 70 different nutrients. So it's really not always um, as simple as a two-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional, you know, problem that we're solving. In fact, here on this slide, I'm showing how amino acids can impact each other. So in example A here, I'm showing how two amino acids can actually benefit each other. It's kind of a syner synergistic effect where they're improving the solubility, each one of the other. And then in example B, it's the opposite. And again, it's alanine and leucine here that are somewhat antagonistic to each other. So the more you have of one, the less soluble the other one is. So that same kind of relationship is summarized in the table here on the right side, where we see that alanine in particular has uh, a positive effect on the green ones, going from cysteine at the top, where it has the most effect, down to threonine. But the same amino acid alanine actually has a negative effect on these four amino acids on the right, leucine, isoleucine, valine, and proline. So just knowing these relationships, understanding how they affect each other is really the foundation of being able to you know, solve some of these problems that I'm talking about. And so just as a summary, I'd like to just talk about the services that we offer from Fujifilm Irvine Scientific. The Express Media Service, I think, is our most popular service, and that's where we're simply providing non-GMP raw materials to support the media development activities or the process development activities at our customers. And so that's a very rapid way to, to uh, you know, acquire materials that you might need to do media development. The middle service, Media Development and Optimization, is where we collaboratively help develop the, the best medium for your process. And so we can do that either in our lab or support activities in your lab. 
again, a very popular service, a way to uh, benefit from, from our experience and the knowledge we have. And then the last service is the one I've been talking about, the MSAT service, which is simply focused on typically later stage projects where we're really focused on reducing cost, improving reliability, and those types of things. So we're excited, you know, with this new offering, we're finding a lot of traction. And, um, you know, in just a moment, Guy will give examples of how far we've gone in terms of uh, providing even automated solutions. And so that's actually what I'm talking about on this slide, looking towards the future. What are some things that we expect to be able to do? Well, again, thanks to Ambic, we expect to be um, using in silico tools much more. So uh, there are some algorithms now that have been developed through Ambic, which can allow us to predict some of these interactions. And you know, most of them are focused on thermodynamics, able to look at um, interactions and solubilities, things like that, uh, speciation of metals. So these are extremely valuable tools. I think they do represent the future of media development and media design. We're excited about that. We're learning how to use these things um, ourselves. And then the second area that we're just as excited about is being able to take these, um, you know, these proven uh, relationships between the nutrients or this understanding of the physical chemistry of powder media and apply that in an automated fashion. And so this is a, a new technology that Guy will be telling us about in just a moment where we're able to, uh, in, you know, leverage automation and uh, reduce human intervention tremendously. So it saves time. I mean, there's a list of benefits and I won't steal the thunder from Guy. I think I'll hand it over now, uh, Guy, if uh, you wanna take it from here. Thanks, Tom. And now I'm going to talk about a new platform that Fujifilm Irvine Scientific have developed and are preparing to launch in the coming months that addresses many of the issues you identified based around the industry feedback. But to take a step back to the beginning, where did it all begin? Well, it actually started around a conversation where we'd been on site doing some media development work with a customer. We'd broken for a cup of coffee, gone to get a cup of coffee mid-morning. And just as the person was putting their, their pod into the coffee in the machine, they, they made a very throwaway remark about, wouldn't it be fantastic if media hydration could be this simple? And that's really set the the chain of thought in motion to try and make this process so simple but what makes media hydration problematic or challenging at least some of the issues that tom spoke about you know if i look at a protocol for media hydration it will probably say something like add the powder slowly slowly means many things to many people many different things to different people it means different things to the same person on monday as, as it does on a friday i'm sure but really what we're having to do with, with cell culture media in the powdered form is we we have to weigh it combine it hydrate it make additions take samples make adjustments and all of that takes time is prone to not not just human error but just variation between operators such that you end up with variations in your media now what we're trying to do when we we take media is is dissolve it and you can see the technical definition of of dissolution on on the screen there but there's things we can do to enhance that mixing there's things we can do to speed it up but all of these things again add variation to a process which ultimately create variation in the final product so if we want to avoid that if we want to simplify that process make it more standardized we need a way of doing that and you can see some of the challenges that the industry faces on the on the on the left hand side there items one to ten now, I'm, I'm not going to read them all out, and many of them have, have already been expressed by Tom in, in the previous part of the presentation. But three, three really key ones are time, just the simple amount of time it takes to make some of these, these, these media and buffers up, powder containment, having that, that fine layer of dust in a facility when, when somebody's been handling powder is, is not, a good, not a good thing to have because it the powder itself is a very rich in, in nutrients and that promotes bio burden, which allows for contamination to occur. 
And then finally, consistency, consistency of the product. If you can make the same base material time and time again, you've got a much better chance of making the same final product time and time again. So how do we do this? How do we solve this, this conundrum? Well, we developed a, a platform called the OCO Rover. And that enables us to deliver a pre-loaded cartridge labeled item B on your screen that contains the majority of the constituents of a cell culture media feed or buffers. That gets positioned onto the system um, and the operator will select their recipe for, through the HMI on point A. Within that platform, we have a single use manifold which controls and directs the flow of water to the right place. And then we may or may not require um, the supplement cartridge, the secondary hydration cartridge labeled D. And that will, if it is required, it's because some of the components that go into that particular media or feed don't dissolve well in a neutral pH. And this is one of the services required to implement this technology where we decide, work with you to, to, to figure out how we balance that formulation so the contents in B and the contents in D work together to give you your, your final product. So how does this work? As I've already mentioned, we will deliver a pre-filled cartridge, and you can see that on the left-hand side in specific packaging that interacts with the machine. But as you look at this, you'll see that there's a cartridge there that's lying in the horizontal and we need to get it into the vertical. Now, given that we could be making as much as 17,000 liters of media, sorry, 1,700 liters of media, not 1,000, or 5,000 liters of buffer, that cartridge can weigh quite, quite a bit, up to maybe 40 or even 50 kilograms, 100 pounds or so. So the machine ena enables you to to lower the, the holding bracket down, that interacts with the, with the cartridge, and then we elevate that up and rotate it into the lock position. And now we've got a cartridge from the horizontal into the vertical, ready to be added to the machine. So now we've got our cartridge in position and we're ready to start manufacturing media. What will happen initially is we will fill that, that cartridge up with, with water and that's entering in through the, through the base and you can see the contrast in the color between the unhydrated powder and the powder that starts to go into solution. As that powder comes out of the top of the cartridge, it goes along that top line that you see at the top of the skid and goes to a sterilizing grade filter. So at the same time as you're hydrating, you're also sterilizing the media. Then you will activate the, the secondary hydration cartridge, which contains all the components that don't dissolve well in a neutral pH. Usually these are things like some of the amino acids that Tom's already mentioned, or possibly things like iron. We create the appropriate environment within that chamber to dissolve those, they get directed into the main chamber and then through the sterilizing gray filter to produce the media in question. One of the things we do as we, we run the development process to make sure that the media is going to hydrate correctly is inspect the media, the, con, the inside of the media cartridge after a run. So we're looking at there's the coarse filter at the top of that, that cartridge that protects the sterilizing grade filter and then looking down at the base of the cartridge just to make sure there's no powder residues, nothing like that that is appearing on that filter to tell us that things haven't gone into solution correctly. As we're running this process and on the skid itself, there are a number of sensors that we're using to monitor and control the process, which produces for us a data set. Now the data set itself looks like a bit of an eye test, so I apologize for that, but there's some very useful information that can be gathered from this. The orange line that you can see starting in the bottom left-hand corner and going to the top right is the total volume. The blue, the darker blue line across the middle is the, uh, the the water supply pressure the light blue line that you see at the beginning is the conductivity spiking at the beginning is conductivity and that is measured throughout the process and gradually drops down to zero 
that's a really useful measure for us because when conductivity hits zero, we know that everything's into solution. Now, if I try, if I demonstrate what's actually going on during the process, at the beginning of a process, we've got a cartridge that's loaded onto the skid and there's no, there's no liquid in there. As we add the liquid and we slowly fill up that cartridge, we've yet to interact with any of the sensors. But at the next step, we can see the conductivity spiked because we're sending hydrated media down the line where that sensor sits just before it hits the sterilizing grade filter. Now, the next step looks as if we've lost a little bit of control of our process, but we absolutely haven't. This is purposeful because what we're doing is creating a pressure drop within, within that chamber. The purpose of that is to break apart any clumps that have formed within, within the, the media cartridge. Cell culture media as a powder likes to form into clumps, which become difficult for the water to get into. So what we do, and you can see occurring here, represented by these pressure drops, is lower the pressure in that chamber, which just pulls all those clumps apart, allows the water in, and allows us to continue hydrating the, the media. So as we go through, you can see more and more of the media is going into solution, and that, that color of that media is getting lighter and lighter until it reaches a point towards the end of the process where everything's in, in solution. We've got a nice, clear um, media cartridge. The conductivity has dropped down to zero. We're gonna trigger now the um, secondary hydration cartridge, which will see that conductivity spike up again. But then we'll get to a stage where we've, we've cleared everything out. Everything's in solution. We've made media and it's been sterilized at the same time. Now, the interesting thing, all the, all the data that's presented there aside, if you look at the elapsed time of this process, it's taken about one hour 15, one hour 20 to make 500 liters of media. Sometimes when we speak to customers, they will tell us it's taking them anywhere between six to 12 hours to do the equivalent step. So one of the things we spoke about very early on was the requirement to speed processes up. And we can see with the technology that we've developed with the OCO Rover platform, we're absolutely achieved that. A little bit easier to um, interpret just because there's a little bit less going on, but it also demonstrates the ability of the system to make buffers is this, is this data set. And you can see again that the orange line, which represents the total volume, the light blue line, which shows conductivity, and the fact that we were able to make a thousand liters of a, a sodium phosphate buffer in a little over one hour, 40 minutes. Now, the really interesting thing within this though, is if you follow the conductivity trace, you see that somewhere between 30 and 35 minutes, it's actually dropped to zero. Now that tells us that everything's in solution. What does that mean? That means we can make concentrated buffers using this technology as well. We don't always have to make the 1x solution. So I'm gonna take a bit of a deeper dive around some of the um, the consumable elements related to the system in terms of the media cartridges and the single use manifolds that are used. We have two main types of cartridge in, and each cartridge has two sizes. Um, we, we choose the size based on the, on the batch volume that we want to make. So if you're going to make a larger volume of, of media, you'll fill it into the larger cartridge on the left hand side. But if you're only going to make a smaller volume, you don't want to use that, that larger device, then we can just basically pack that into the smaller, smaller cartridge on the left-hand side. You'll see there, there's, there's a top and a bottom inlet as well as an outlet. Now the bottom inlet directs water through the base of the cartridge, through the powder to complete the hydration. The top inlet is positioned just under that coarse filter that we spoke about earlier, and that sweeps the face of that filter to stop it blocking because cell culture media that doesn't go into solution immediately likes to float. And if it floated all the way to the top and hit that coarse filter, it would potentially block that. So we prevent that from happening by just having a, an inlet at the top there. And at the very top, you can see a valve, which is the outlet feeding to the sterilizing grade filter. Similarly, we have the secondary hydration cartridges. Now the, these aren't always required. They, usually required for media and feeds, seldomly required for, um, for buffers. 
that again, they contain the, the products that don't go into solution nicely or will cause precipitation if they go, go into solution um, in, in the main bulk. So, and again, the selection of this is just purely based upon batch size. Looking at the single use manifold, this is purposefully designed for the process and contains a number of sensors which allow us to control and monitor the process but also the design is specific to the to the system such that we're minimizing the hold up volume and making sure that the, the flow and the direction of the water is is correct so looking now at some of the the implementation you know, the implementation of the technology probably the first step is is a media optimization and normally when you talk about that, and certainly when Tom was talking about that in the context earlier, it's about optimizing your media per for performance in terms of the number of cells per mil or the number of grams per liter of product that you can produce. In this context though, what we're talking about is media optimization to implement the OCO Rover technology. So we're taking that formulation and making sure that the right components are in the primary cartridge and the right components are in the secondary cartridge to optimize that, that hydration process, either for um, material interactions or just purely for, for speed and, and convenience. We can also look at assembly design. You may want to change the assembly to accommodate some sampling regimes. Um, and and that's, that's something we can certainly do, but fundamentally the assembly is what enables the process to work. So we won't be changing the, the flow paths and the direction. Obviously going into manufacturing, you'd look for support from the, us as a vendor of the equipment through the validation cycle, through the, the factory acceptance test, the site acceptance tests, the installation and operational qualification, and possibly support around performance qualification. The ability to provide training is very important with, 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 any, with any equipment. And certainly that's something that we are able to help with as well as preventative maintenance to ensure the machine works optimally for as, for as long as you'd expect it to. But really looking back at that media optimization service, I just want to emphasize this isn't about getting more product out of the system. It's about using the experience that exists within Fujifilm Irvine Scientific to optimize the way the media components are presented on the skid to ensure the correct hydration in a in a timely and efficient way. When we spoke to our when we sorry when we developed the technology, we had a number of things that we were thinking about. You know, how do we simplify the process? So we do that by having that that control screen that stores recipes that enables the operators to go in, select a recipe, and then pretty much walk away and get the same output time and time again. So we're, there we're talking about the simplified one-touch system and dependable results, but also looking at the turnaround time and the setup time. How quickly can you go from making a media to making a buffer to making a media again? And within that system, how do you ensure that you, you control the exposure of the media that you're making to any contamination? but also control the contamination of the working environment where people are, are moving things around and potentially being exposed to, to dust um, within, within that system. And the technology with it developed ensures that we have a contained system, contained from the enclosure point of view, so protecting what's inside the chamber, but also protecting what's outside of the chamber and then critically backed up by that support that we've spoken about on a number of, number of times through the presentation. But really interestingly, when we started talking to some of our customers about this technology, they came up with a, a few more benefits that the system would bring them that we actually hadn't thought about. You know, the reduction of CapEx and OPEX, so capital expenditure, operational expenditure, because you're reducing the amount of equipment you need you're reducing your validation costs, your, your maintenance costs, reducing complexity because instead of having to handle and develop, uh, work with a range of single use consumables, you're now using these, this cartridge system, which covers a range of volumes from a couple of hundred liters 
up to um, 1,700 liters if you're making media or 5,000 liters if you're making buffer. The enhanced compliance, because you're now making the same product the same way time and time again. You're taking the human element out of it. As, as Tom said, with nothing against human beings, but if we can standardize something to produce the same product time and again, that's, that's a benefit. Um, looking at environmental health and safety, you know, manual handling, powder exposure, dust containment, all of these things are really important when you're doing the same operation time and again. And having systems and processes in place, workflows developed that mitigate man manual handling or eliminate powder exposure are really, really valuable and important to our, our customers. And all of that feeds into this final bit about operational flexibility, being able to respond to unexpected demands quicker, being able to reduce startup times, being able to do, use the same infrastructure to produce more is, is really important. So I'd like to leave you with that thought and say thank you very much for your attention. And now is time for our live Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Tom and Guy, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question um, is for Tom. What techniques can you suggest for improving hydration of powered cell culture medium that is difficult to get in solution? Okay, well, that's a great question because that's sort of the main theme we've been talking about. Um, so, but it really does depend on the formula. So I guess it's, it's hard to answer without having a formula to look at, but you know, we do know that there are some common issues and you probably recall on the slides, I was talking a lot about pH. So as it turns out, a lot of these nutrients are pH dependent or the solubility of the nutrients is, is pH dependent. So that might be something we look at. We might actually compartmentalize um, some of the nutrients based on you know, what particular pH is best to, to dissolve them. And actually I'm happy to report that you, know, you can actually dissolve something at an extreme pH. And then when you combine it with the others at a neutral pH, you know, in, in many cases, it will remain in solution. It's not like, you know, you have to keep it at a high pH in order to keep it dissolved. And so that's that's the nature of a lot of these issues that we deal with. I guess I also actually mentioned the idea of ionic strength can be a factor for some of these components. So just keeping in mind, you know, what the particular physical environment is for the troublesome nutrient. So, so, you know, I'm kind of talking generally now because we don't have a formula, you know, a specific formula, but once we had this specific formula, we could sit down, have a look at it and consider, you know, what are the factors that are making this difficult to dissolve? Maybe it's, maybe it's pH, maybe it's ionic strength, maybe it's some other uh, combination of interactions between the components, you know, they're kind of competing for, you know, whatever, um, you know, whatever you know, advantage that they might share, they might be competing for something that affects their, their solubility. So it's kind of a long answer, but you know, it really does depend on the formula and the particular chemistry. And, you know, we're happy, I guess the reason we're talking here publicly about this is we're happy to be part of the solution. So, you know, if you can show me a formula, I'd be happy to have a look at it with you and talk about what's possible. And maybe it's not possible. I'll tell you that too. I'll tell you, you know, you'd really have to change that formula if you wanted to dissolve the way you expect it to. So I'll, I'll tell you that. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is for Guy. The media cartridge looks like, looks about 50 liters in size. What volumes can you make with the OCO Rover? Thank you. Um, I mean, similar to as, as Tom started his answer, first thing to say is some of this is actually formula dependent. Um, so if, you know, the, the amount of material required to make a liter of a liquid will determine ultimately how much we can make in the OCO Rover. Uh, the question is right in that the cylinder is approximately 50 liters, but using the technology, we're able to make approximately 1700 liters of a cell culture media and, and or about 5,000 liters of any particular buffer. And that's 
because of the way the system works. Rather than adding powder to water, we're adding water to powder, which means we don't need the total volume in the initial chamber. So because of that, as I say, we're able to make those volumes that I spoke about there. Thank you. Thank you. Another question for you. You said you could make 500 liters in about one and a half hours. How quickly could you make a thousand liters and could you do more than one batch per day? Yes. Okay. So yes, you, you could make, you can, you can definitely do more than one batch a day. Um, we've run experiments where we've done as many as 10 batches in a day, make, making smaller volumes, not in the thousands of liters measured in the hundreds of liters. Um, we've also had days where we've run process scale volume. So again, sort of high hundreds into thousands where we've run three, four, five batches in a day. Um, to, to make that thousand litre volume, you're probably looking at somewhere between two hours, two hours, 15 minutes, maybe two hours, 20, something like that. So it's a little bit, you know, it's longer again than the 500, but it's, it's certainly not double. It's not double the time. And ultimately what this comes down to is water flow. We're trying to push water through the system to hydrate the powder. And if you run at a higher flow, the, the time will be less. If you run at a lower flow, the time will be more. But as a general rule of thumb, what you'll find is it's definitely quicker than using the, the existing mixer-based technology that we, we see today. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question here is for Tom. Can you contrast the commonly encountered stability issues for powdered media compared to liquid media? Okay, well, I don't want to be flippant, but I mean, there's a huge difference in terms of, um, you know, powder is much more stable than liquid. So generally speaking, you know, liquid is where we're concerned about degradation. And that's because you, you're in an environment where these degradation kinetics can occur. And so it will occur. And so we think of things like glutamine, riboflavin, things that may, um, may degrade in an aqueous environment. Um, so that's, you know, there's a, there's a huge difference between liquid and powder. Um, with powder, it is important to keep it dry because that moisture, the water is what gives opportunity for things to degrade and interact with each other. If you have a dry powder, it's, I'm sure it's going to be good for two years or more. And so it's got a much longer shelf life. And actually that relates to this idea of having an automated system with a cartridge of powder because in a way, what we're talking about is, you know, I guess the stability of powder, you have very stable powder in cartridges, along with the convenience of liquid. In, in other words, you can, uh, you can have liquid on a um, very short notice, you can have ready to use liquid in just, uh, you know, an hour, a couple hours, like we just mentioned. So the idea that you can have ready to use liquid in such a short time, but still have a stable shelf life like you do with powder, I think is is a great question. I appreciate the chance to talk about stability because I think it highlights this uh, new technology and what's what's become available for the first time, I think. Great, thank you. Some great questions here. Um, back to you, Guy. With the OCO Rover, what do you see as having the biggest impact overall? Sure. Um, I think it's consistency of the material produced where the, the greatest gains will be generated. If you, if you look at a lot of, lot of the ways media is made up today, it's a multi-stage process involving additions, mixing, sampling, titrations, all sorts of things where the, where the human interacts with the process, where decisions are being made by, by, by an individual. Now, we, we have nothing against people. We think people are great. But if you can automate that process, you can eliminate some of that variability in the product that comes out. By eliminating variability, you drive consistency of the product, you drive consistency of the process. And that's you know, the, one of the major items of feedback that we get from the trials that we've run with some of our customers, um, that they love the consistency of the product. The product's made the same, and it produces the same results time and time again. But yeah, consistency is what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. How is the programming of the system done? Sure. So the, the you know, initially um, the program, the recipe, if you will, will be created by the team at Fujifilm Irvine Scientific. 
and that will be transferred to the customer because the hydration steps that we go through, whether it's the pulsation steps, um, liquid entering from the base, from the top, uh, are optimized for, for that cell, particular cell culture media. As a customer gains more experience, more understanding of the system, and they'll, be, they'll be able to do that themselves. But initially, that will be part of the service that, that we provide. Great, and we have time for just a few more questions. Next question here is the media ready to use, what adjustment adjustment checks are required? So one of the key benefits of, of this technology and the interaction with, with our um, R&D team is that we will balance the formulation in such a way that the media you end up with as it comes out of the machine and is collected either directly into a bioreactor or into a whole tank is actually ready to use. There are no pH adjustments required, no osmolarity adjustments required. So the, the answer to the, the question is, is none. There's, there's, no, there's no adjustments required. That material comes out ready to use through, through the OCO River. Thank you. No problem. Now back to you, Tom, for the last question. Are these improvements tied to the use of um, your own proprietary media formulas, or can we ask for help with the formulas we own? Okay, right. Yeah, I'm happy to clarify that because um, just like the MSAT service, or I'm not sure if you're asking about OSHA Rover MSAT service, but the answer is the same because, um, you know, we've, we've worked with our own formulas, but most of our work has been done with customer formulas. So it really is what we're offering is something in terms of support and help for formulas that are owned by our customers. So we can work either way. We obviously want to make sure that our own formulas serve as great examples of what, what's possible. And that's true. We've worked with our own formulas, but um, for the most part, you know, because a lot of our existing business is largely focused on supporting custom media formulas owned by our customers, these offerings that we're talking about, the service and the Osho Rover, are designed to support um, processes where the formulas are owned by the customer. So yeah, we're, we're definitely ready for that and eager to help wherever we can. Thank you. I'm gonna ask just one last question here. Do all your manufacturing sites have the same capabilities? Oh, okay, right. Yeah, I mentioned briefly at the beginning how we have uh, now four, or we have three manufacturing sites and the fourth one is being built. So I'm happy to say, you know, it's fairly simple in terms of them all having similar equipment, similar processes. We use the same milling and blending technologies at all the sites. Um, the one thing that's different when I think about the differences in Japan, we're manufacturing only powder. Uh, so we're not doing the liquid manufacturing in Japan the same way we do at the other three sites. And then I believe there are some um, additional capabilities in the new facility in the Netherlands related to handling caustics and, you know, things like that, as well as in North Carolina, I expect we'll be doing a lot more liquid buffers and things like that. So, you know, I don't, it's kind of a long answer, but I think they're very similar in terms of how they're, uh, the, the technology is used for manufacturing. But when you get down to the details, there will be some small differences between between the facilities. Um, and obviously one reason we have more than one facility is that we can use facilities as a backup. So we have business continuity, you know, this kind of assurance of supply. It's a very important principle to our customers. And so we're able to um, qualify more than one supply site for, for any customer who, who needs that. Yeah, we, we're, you know, what our strategy is looking at the, the shortening of supply chains and the building of redundancy into our, our into our systems and our processes and our capabilities and that, that's really important for us because the materials we make go into critical biopharmaceutical products and, and vaccines so you know we're, we're aware of the need to build that redundancy that security of supply in great thank you again so much tom and guy for your time today and your important research we'd also like to thank lab roots and our sponsor fuji Fujifilm Irvine Scientific for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to also thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. 
Questions we do not have time for today and those submitting during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone, goodbye.